My favorite thing working in uh, our studio is that we basically have all the freedom we want to have. We can do whatever we want um, because we are completely independent. We have people who don't have to do anything with games, actually. We have a costume designer working on the little costumes for the puppets and so on. And I think this has some other advantages as well, because, you know, you have a, the pair person dedicated for actually this thing instead of having, you know, a character artist in games, for example, who would usually be the one also designing the costumes, right? I mean, that's a general thing. We, we never were too shy to change things even late in the development if, if they worked better. We constantly updated to the newest version during the development of our game, which everyone says to not do. While we shipped uh, Harold Talibet with Unity 2022.3, thanks to the help of the graphics team and working closely together with them, we were able to actually test Unity 6 features before the release of Unity 6. So we had some of them backported to Unity 2022.3 <laughs> and um, amongst these features were, for example, STP. Spatial Temple Post Processing or STP basically helped us achieve um, a, an amazing visual quality on consoles without compromising the performance. So upscaling has become the, a go-to solution for pretty much every high fidelity game coming out nowadays. Uh, and that the same is true for our game, Harold Halibut. Trying to find the balance where to cut things, where to save performance with other upscaling solutions like TAU or FSR, for example, we couldn't lower the resolution as much as we do now with um, spatial temporal post-processing because at one point it just looked broken. Thanks to STP, we were able to output in 4K on the consoles while only natively rendering in 1440p, but the visual difference is almost negligible. So you, it, it really looks amazing if you compare an upscaled image with STP to a native image. There is not a lot of difference in, in terms of sharpness. We even did some stress testing with STP actually, um, just to see how, how well it holds up. Outputting at full HD uh, and rendering only 33% of the image, which basically means a native resolution of 300p or something, which is, uh, you know, like the old TVs of uh, 30 years ago. Um, and it, it still looked clean. And then you can imagine, going to up to an out output resolution of 4K on modern consoles and just uh, rendering, for example, uh, Full HD or 1440p almost looks like the native 4K and saves so much on GPU performance that uh, yeah, it basically helped us to deliver the game with the great visual quality that we wanted, but also not compromising on the performance. Harold Halibut is a narrative game about friendship and life on a spaceship crash landed uh, on a water planet uh, and now stuck under sea. A lot of the things that we do now are already clear in the very, very first idea, which was to create a stop motion adventure underwater. That was basically the initial idea. Now, a lot of things we did was uh, balancing between how much do we want to go in the direction of stop motion and how much do we want to utilize how the digital world works. Um, for example, the animation was very smooth. Uh, we didn't like to try to mimic stop motion there because gameplay-wise it felt better. And the same goes for water. We actually did the first iteration of water uh, in Shader Graph using um, four frames of scanned normal maps from like actual physically built water surfaces and then swap them out as a flip book to create stop motion-y looking water. But it was too annoying to, to look at it because it was like constantly moving and so on. And if when slowed down uh, the frame rate, it, it just uh, didn't work really well. And at that point, we switched to the HDRP water because it just looked nice and had the caustics and stuff like that. So about the water in our game, uh, we are not only using the Unity water system for that, but also um, the volumetric fog. 
the water that you see outside the windows basically is just made out of fog. Um, basically, we are, we are using different fog volumes and adding and subtracting them for other things that are inside there. And just use baked lighting, uh, which thanks to APV can be applied to the volumetric fog as well to create this like uh, feeling of, of dense, you know, waterness, I would say, in the outside world. In addition to that, we have some like plankton particles that you know are, are a mix again of like hand drawn little uh, particle shapes, but then through the use of VFX graph, we spread them around, and it's because it's very efficient. We can have literally have like thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of them around. Iterating on the HDRP water system to to get the look we wanted was actually quite fast. We kind of had a concept of how the water should look thanks to the shadigraph water we built prior to that, which went into the right direction. Um, so things like how it should be colored or so were already kind of clear. So basically um, the first step was just, you know, trying to adjust the HDRP water so that the, the general look in terms of like the strength of the waves and the, the color matches whatever we had there before, which was a process of like five minutes or so. And then from there on, we looked into all the additional features it offered. APV enabled us to do like a couple of things that didn't work out as well before with uh, light probes and light maps. Before, when we were using um, light maps and light probes, we had the beautiful lighting thanks to the light maps on the background objects or, or like the, all the static objects, but our characters only took, you know, the lighting information from light pro probes and there could be some inconsistencies, especially because light probes were always applied on a per object basis and not on a per pixel basis like uh, as, as the APVs do. So in general, that was the immediate thing we noticed when whenever we switched to the APVs was that uh, everything just felt more consistent. Because APV looked so great, we were able to replace light maps in most of like the scenes of our game and utilize APV for everything. And um, by doing that, we were able to use baking sets to um, basically blend between two different lighting situations during runtime to have a day and night cycle, basically. One thing I also love with using APVs is that um, the lighting information stored in the APVs can also be applied to volumetric fog. So before, for the outside world of our game, where we are mimicking this like watery, that dense watery uh, volume kind of, we had to use real-time lights to uh, get some you know volumetric lighting going, and we were mixing differently colored real-time lights. Thanks to HGRP, it is relatively efficient um, to use lots of uh, lights. Obviously, it's even more efficient to use baked lighting. So by using APV, we could switch all those real-time lights we were only using to basically create the volumetric lighting in the outside world to baked lights. And it's all entirely baked now in the yeah, outside world, which saves a lot of performance and makes it even look better because uh, yeah, of the light transport inside the scenes. Unity 6, though, marks uh, quite a very important release, I think, personally, especially because of uh, spatial temporal post-processing, which really helps to get a lot of performance gains. It also has GPU-driven rendering, which also gave us quite a substantial performance boost. There are just so many features that, uh, yeah, especially on the performance side, that I personally think are super interesting. STP alone or spatial temporal post processing would be like, even if it was only that feature, that would be enough for me to move on to Unity 6, actually, because it's, it's just a, such a game changer, especially if you are um, porting your game to consoles, but also on PC. Now that we have built this graphics pipeline, it's kind of obvious that we're going to use it for all our future games and projects. In fact, we are even continuing some research on it, evolving it. We made it more efficient over time, automated some of the processes like the 3D scanning with finally automated turntables and so on. And it's beyond having this very nice visual look, which I think personally I still love the look of it. It's also very nice to have 
the interdisciplinary team that we have, which wouldn't be possible with any other way of working. Yeah, we will definitely continue making games in this way.